Let's talk about placing firewalls in an Azure environment. We'll first cover the placement of a single firewall, then talk about how we handle scalability and resilience for that firewall, and then build out a hub and spoke topology. Cisco offers two firewalls for the Azure environment, the ASA and FTD. The ASA, which stands for Adaptive Security Appliance, is the best of breed layer three through four firewall. Firepower Threat Defense, FTD, builds on that functionality, adding layer seven capabilities, including URL filtering, application visibility control, advanced malware detection, intrusion prevention, and security intelligence. Now we could talk about either firewall, we're gonna focus on the FTD. So we have a data center, involves three subnets in this case, in a VNet, very simple example, and it's connecting to the internet. So the question is, where do we put our firewall? We know that we have a management and diagnostic network. That's not really an issue. That's a separate in the deployment. But we also have an inside and outside network to our firewall. And I think it's clear that the internet connects to the outside network of our firewall. But how do we connect the inside of our firewall to our production subnets? Well, we need to get traffic from those subnets to the firewall. And one thing we could do is put the firewall on one of those subnets, but that introduces sort of an asymmetry. It's best to keep the inside subnet separate. That could be all in one VNet, but generally speaking, it is best practice to break this into two VNets and use VNet pairing the VNet pairing will guarantee the traffic makes it between the production VNet and what we call the service VNet, where we have our firewall deployed. Now, to assure that, for east-west and outbound traffic, we have to create a route table, or UDR, within Azure. The next hop being the firewall inside interface, and the we have to associate that UDR with every subnet that we want to communicate through the firewall. Notice that the next hop does not have to be on the same subnet as the associated subnet CIDR in Azure route tables. So let's go through the NAT configuration on the firewall. First of all, the inbound traffic will be directed toward the outside interface IP of the firewall so therefore its destination must be replaced with the target server. In this case, we call it web server. And for the return traffic or outbound connections, you need to pat every connection to the outside interface. So the source will be the IP address of the outside interface. This particular NAT statement is typical of any firewall deployment in any environment. We want to replace this with a scalable and resilient deployment. So what do we do? Well, here's what we've got so far. And let's focus on the service VNet. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace the firewall with multiple firewalls. In this case, I'm showing you two. And we have a public load balancer for the outside interface and an internal load balancer for the inside interface. This is called a load balancer sandwich. But don't be misled, the traffic never goes through both load balancers. And so let me show you the flow of the traffic in detail. The traffic for inbound connections, or sometimes called north-south traffic, hits the public IP address of the load balancer and is forwarded to one of the firewalls. The firewall then does the inspection and sends the traffic to the target server. Well, that's simple enough. What about the return traffic? Well, there's an issue. How does the target server know where to return the traffic? After all, the packet would be identical in terms of its source IP, irrespective of which firewall it went through. So what we do is we have to do source NAT along with destination NAT on the firewall where we replace the source 
with the IP address of the inside interface. Now that's going to be different for each firewall and therefore it will be unambiguous how to return the traffic. Once the traffic's returned, it's sent out to the internet. Notice that the public load balancer is stateful. The east-west traffic, somewhat similar, except the traffic is going to hit the internal load balancer and be distributed to one of the firewalls. And then the firewalls will send the traffic to the appropriate server. Now let's think about the return traffic. This is a little bit trickier, but actually a little bit nicer. We could do what we did before. Use source NAT on the firewalls to, to make the two firewalls have distinct source IPs and therefore it's unambiguous where to return the traffic. But it turns out that we can avoid source NAT by using the internal load balancer. In other words, we forward the return traffic to the internal load balancer. This makes, believe it or not, the routing easier in Azure. And because the internal load balancer maintains state, it will recognize that this, that this is the return traffic from a packet that it had sent to a particular firewall, and it will know which firewall to return the traffic to. This sort of stateful approach to getting the traffic to the right firewall only works if the traffic enters and leaves the firewall through the same interface. Now for outbound traffic, the situation is similar, but actually a bit easier. The traffic hits the internal load balancer, goes to the firewall, and from the firewall goes to the internet. There's really only one question here that is unanswered, and that would, what would be the source address? It turns out this is a bit complicated. So it, in the one case, your firewalls could have public IP addresses associated with their outside interfaces. Then, not surprisingly, it would simply use those public IP addresses. One of the concerns with that is that the public IP address would be different for the different connections. If the devices do not have a public IP address, but they belong to the back-end pool of a load balancer, Azure can use, and will by default, use the load balancer public IP address for the source address, which is a little odd because the external, the public load balancer isn't load balancing, but its IP address is available for use. If this isn't what you want, or you're concerned with such things as port exhaustion, you want to have different source IPs for different services or whatnot, you can configure what are called outbound rules. That gives you much more granular control over which IP addresses are used for what traffic. So now let's look at the return traffic. They, it'll hit whatever IP address you've chosen as described in the previous slide. It'll hit the firewalls and then be forwarded directly to the appropriate internal server. Now just a little bit about best practices. Obviously, when we're talking about redundancy, it is better to have availability zones. Those require, apply a SLA of 99.99% uptime as opposed to 99.9% .9 for a standalone device or 99.95% for an availability set. So if you have more than one firewall in a load balance configuration, best practice, use more than one availability zone. But it turns out that the traffic between availability zones has equivalent latency as traffic within an availability zone as long as you stay in the same Azure region. So now we see the picture of our uh, service subnet involving possibly many firewalls in a load balance sandwich peered to our production subnet. Now, um, with regards to the routing, all you have to do very simple, is replace the next top in your route table 
with the FIP of the internal load balancer. And your east, west, and outbound traffic will be routed correctly. Now, as a remark about health probes, the load balancers, both the internal and external, are keeping track of the health of the objects, in this case, the uh, firewalls, using either TCP, HTTP, or HTTPS. We recommend TCP probes, and we recommend that you use port 22 because you can configure the firewalls to respond to connections on data interfaces on port 22. And it's fairly easy to do that. This is something called a platform setting on the firewall. Here you see the screen in the Firepower Management Center, or FMC. And this is a very, very simple configuration of secure shell access for the data interfaces. As far as the NAT configuration, hmm, it sure looks the same. But let's look more carefully. So there are two differences here in the uh, inbound NAT rules. First of all, notice that we are actually translating the source. If you recall, this is necessary so that the return traffic can unambiguously find the appropriate firewall. That was not translated in the NAT rules of the standalone firewall deployment. Also, because you're doing source NAT, you're not allowed to use static NAT. You must have dynamic NAT. So those are the two differences. Now routing, there's one gotcha. And that is that the health probes need to be responded to. And the health probes use the same IP address, 168.63.129.16, for both the inside and outside load balancers. Now, we have a default route that will guarantee that the outside load balancer receives the response. But we also have to add a route for that IP address with the exit interface being the inside. Typically, you're going to have that default route by default. You're going to have to add that extra route for your probe on the inside. Now, what we want to talk about is how we would deploy this in a hub and spoke environment. And here's you know, a typical diagram that you would see uh, in a Microsoft document with a hub and spoke a topology. Notice you have multiple spokes connected to a hub and you have VNet peerings. However, it's very important to understand that VNet peering is not transitive, which means that spokes cannot talk to each other unless you set up explicit peering, which is not scalable if you have a large number of spokes, or you have some kind of VPN connections, which is also not scalable or you route through a device in the hub. And that's what we're going to talk about. And what's that device? Well, you might have guessed it's a firewall. So this solves the problem of the lack of the transitive routing, but it's probably what you want anyway, because you want the traffic between the spokes to go through the firewall device. This gives you a scalable security solution for a hub and spoke topology. Okay, so this is where we were with our set up and you know how far away are we from having a hub and spoke topology here uh -huh. well I'll give you a hint why don't we take this service vnet and call it a hub and let's take this production vnet and call it a spoke and as you can see we already have a hub and spoke topology it just might not be so obvious because there's only one spoke so the the term service net notice vnet Notice that it, it's sometimes called a security VNet because it's where you put your security devices. And it's sometimes called a transit VNet because that's traffic tends to go through it. And that's really the hub in our hub and spoke environment. And of course, we can have other spokes. So here we're showing two spokes connected to the same hub. Now, if you have an external network that you want to connect to this environment, you also connect it to the hub through what's called a virtual network gateway. And that will uh, require either an IPsec VPN connection 
or a lot of people use Express Route. So that could be the main office connecting, or it could be another Azure environment or another public cloud environment. And now really, all that we're left with is trying to figure out how to set up the routing to make sure the traffic we want to go through the firewalls goes through the firewalls, and the traffic we want to bypass the firewalls bypasses the firewalls. And that is the subject of the next presentation in this series. Thank you very much for your time.